Over the last few months, Huawei has been the subject of heavy scrutiny, with several countries accusing them of spying on foreign companies and stealing trade secrets. Huawei has even been banned from doing business with US companies, which means Google is no longer allowing Android to run on Huawei devices, which is an unprecedented move in the smartphone industry. So what exactly is Huawei doing wrong to receive so much backlash from the public and private sector? Well, that's exactly what we're going to find out. This is Greg with Apple Explained, and I want to thank Squarespace for sponsoring this video. If you want to help decide which topics I cover, make sure you're subscribed, and these voting polls will show up in your mobile activity feed. Now, I want to give you some background on Huawei as a company to help put these recent events in perspective. They're a Chinese company founded back in 1987 whose primary goal was to help modernize China's underdeveloped telecommunications infrastructure. Because back then, the US and other wealthy countries like Hong Kong had already developed advanced telephone technology that was being utilized by governments and companies alike. The infrastructure served as a sort of closed-circuit telephone system, and Huawei wanted to develop similar technology to sell in China. And how did they manage to do that? Well, they started off by buying private branch exchange, or PBX, telephone switching systems from Hong Kong companies, and then reselling those switches to customers in China. But serving as a salesperson of foreign technology wasn't a very sustainable business model. Huawei knew they had to develop their own PBX technology, and they did so by reverse engineering the switches imported from Hong Kong and developing manufacturing techniques to produce their own telephone switching systems. By 1990, the company employed about 600 research and development staffers and began selling their technology to small businesses and hotels. Their products sold well, and Huawei's success snowballed from there. They eventually began to sell their products internationally, winning contracts with the British telecommunications conglomerate Vodafone, British Telecom, Australian carrier Optus, and Canadian characters Bell Mobility and Telus Mobility. Huawei also built one of the first LTE networks in the world back in 2009 for Talia Sonera in Norway. All this overseas success generated $2.1 billion of revenue for Huawei and earned them a spot in the 2010 Global Fortune 500. But despite their rapid international growth, very few people outside of China had ever heard of Huawei. That is, until their smartphones began selling like crazy. In fact, Huawei's growth in the global smartphone market over the past four years has been an incredible achievement. While companies like Apple and Samsung have struggled with market saturation and slowing sales, Huawei achieved 50% year-over-year growth in smartphone sales this year, which was enough to outsell Apple and become the world's second largest smartphone manufacturer. So how exactly did Huawei manage to achieve all this success so quickly? Well, that's where the drama comes in. The company's rise to power was plagued with intellectual property infringement and industrial espionage. Here are some of the most blatant examples. Back in 2004, a company called Lemco was founded by Motorola engineer Xiaowei Pan, and right after creating Menco, Pan visited China and met with Huawei's CEO and other top executives. It was later discovered that Lemco was created to build wireless technology for Huawei based on stolen trade secrets and technology from Motorola. Pan even sent an email to Huawei's CEO that said, If our plan can progress smoothly, Lemco will be the company we're planning to establish, and it will be independent of Motorola Inc. And keep in mind that Pan wasn't just an entry-level engineer at Motorola. He had been with the company for over 10 years, had been responsible for 60 patents, and became director of architecture in Motorola's wireless business department. So he had access to some of the most advanced technology Motorola was working on. Now, Pan and Huawei were eventually sued in federal court, and the case was settled confidentially in 2010. But the effects of Huawei's espionage were irreversible. Their easy GSM base station for 2G networks had played a huge role in the company's growth, but the technology in that product turned out to be stolen from Motorola. Huawei has since become the world's number one wireless infrastructure company and forced others like Motorola out of the business. And this is just one example of Huawei's illegal behavior. There are other countless examples that I could probably dedicate an entire video to. They stole source code from Cisco, they willfully violated five patents held by Panoptis, they tried using MPEG's AVC video technology without licensing it, and the list goes on. 
Also, keep in mind, these are only the things Huawei was caught doing wrong. Who knows how much they were actually able to get away with. I also want to mention that while Samsung was sued by Apple for copying the original iPhone, Huawei seems to have done the same thing without any repercussions at all. There were even allegations that stolen trade secrets and patents were utilized to create Huawei's recently released Mate 10X Pro. In fact, when the company tried hiring Apple suppliers to manufacture the MateBook, they refused, since one of the components was considered to be an infringement on Apple's patent. Now, as we cover Huawei's recent controversies, you'll notice that things start to get more political, and I'm going to do my best to simply report the facts. So in 2018, the Five Eyes Intelligence Alliance, which is made up of Australia, Canada, New Zealand, the United Kingdom, and the United States, alleged that Chinese cellular network equipment may contain backdoors that allow surveillance by the Chinese government. Keep in mind that Huawei, a Chinese company, was and is the world's number one supplier of telecommunications equipment. So naturally, governments all over the world began to grow suspicious of them, especially since they have a track record of illegal and immoral behavior. But Huawei hasn't taken these allegations lying down. They've criticized the claims as being politically motivated without any evidence to back them up. Huawei said they've never placed backdoors in their products and wouldn't give the Chinese government access to user data. But I should mention that according to Chinese law, companies are required to assist the government intelligence agency on the collection of user data as needed, although this also happens in other countries like the US. But despite the claim's uncertainty, the controversy led to countries debating whether or not to use Chinese telecommunication equipment in the development of their new 5G infrastructure. And this is when everything started to go south for Huawei. Australia was the first company to ban Huawei and their Chinese competitor ZTE from their 5G rollout, and it wasn't long before New Zealand and the US followed suit. But perhaps the most damaging backlash Huawei received was from President Trump's executive order, which said US companies are restricted from doing any business with them. And that's led to a domino effect of companies cutting ties with Huawei in many different ways. Google is no longer allowing Android to run on new Huawei devices, Intel, Qualcomm, and ARM aren't letting Huawei use their chips, and the SD Association isn't letting Huawei put micro SD slots in any of their future products. And this isn't even considering all the miscellaneous components Huawei sources from US companies that they'll no longer have access to. And if you're wondering how in the world Huawei is going to respond to all these restrictions, we have some clues as to what they might be planning. When it comes to the software, Huawei has actually been working on their own mobile operating system, complete with an app store, for quite some time in order to reduce their dependence on Google but they're likely facing unexpected pressure to finish the OS much earlier than originally planned. And if we've learned anything from Windows phones, it's that establishing an alternative to iOS and Android is a huge challenge, especially when considering Huawei won't be able to include apps from US developers on their platform. It's also worth mentioning that this ban will affect more than just Huawei's smartphones, because their notebook computers also use an operating system from a US company, Microsoft and it's unknown if Huawei is developing their own desktop OS as well. Now, when it comes to hardware, things don't get any easier. Like I said before, Huawei sources a large portion of their components from US companies, and without those parts, the threat of manufacturing slowdowns appears imminent unless Huawei can quickly find new suppliers outside the US. But in the meantime, Huawei has stockpiled about three months worth of US components while they figure out how to make a successful transition. The problem is, certain components simply cannot be replaced. For example, if you've been banned by the SD Association, that means you can't include SD cards in your products at all. So this is definitely an uphill battle for Huawei that doesn't appear to be getting any easier anytime soon. Now what does all this mean for people who own a Huawei product? Well, you'll continue to receive software updates for the next 90 days, but after that time, your phone will stay the way it is forever, unless the ban is reversed at some point in the future. Now, if Huawei does in fact release their own operating system, you may be able to upgrade to it, or you may not, depending on the older hardware's compatibility. And when it comes to Huawei's notebooks, Microsoft has yet to come to a decision regarding their Windows license. Many people are assuming Microsoft will do the same thing as Google and stop providing their OS to Huawei, but that's just speculation at this point. So Huawei's explosive rise in the smartphone market appears to have been stunted for the time being. 
But there's no saying where the story will go from here. Huawei is worth billions of dollars, and they'll do anything to maintain their success in spite of this setback. And although government agencies do have valid concerns about the company, I'm hoping Huawei will remain a serious player in the tech industry since heightened competition benefits all of us consumers by forcing other tech companies to create the best products they possibly can. And when it comes to creating the best, I recommend Squarespace if you want to build the best, most beautiful website you can, all without spending tons of money on development, designing, and hosting, and without worrying about patching or installations or any of that complicated stuff. Squarespace is an all-in-one platform with a super easy to use drag and drop interface that offers hundreds of customizable templates. And if you get stuck or don't know what to do next, you can always reach out to their 24 seven customer support team through live chat or email. And if you already have a third party domain, you don't have to get a new one. You can just transfer it to Squarespace. And that isn't even considering the e-commerce features that allow you to sell merch or products online and easily manage inventory and shipments. I actually use Squarespace for my own website after trying quite a few different services, and I highly recommend it. So head over to squarespace.com slash Apple Explained and get 10% off your first purchase. You can find a link to that in the description. Alright guys, thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.